Welcome, everybody, to the second episode of the Rubber Gum Anime Podcast, where I am the gum, my friend August here is the rubber, and we are, we're coming at you with a very special episode today. We have been oh, talking hilarious. about this, oh, it'll be, oh boy, it'll be special, all right? We've been talking about this with, with many people, so some of you might already be aware of what we're talking about, and if you don't, trust me, that's even a better way to experience what you're about to experience, <laughs> because the, the rabbit hole we're about to go down is truly something special but today we are going to be uh after we do our brief introductory segment talking about what we have been maybe reading manga wise or japan adjacent things or watching anime wise we are going to be yeah. talking about the anime from 2000 and 11 12 i think 11 i believe mirai nikki aka the real name in real name <laughs> <fucking>. <laughs> racism um future diary we are going to be talking about that and we are also briefly going to touch on the the ova future uh, diary redial uh, redial uh, with oof but um you yeah, word is so. briefly <laughs> i i think it might even be possible that we could talk about it for longer than its actual duration so oh. Yeah. who knows but uh today we are going to start off we talked about our favorite anime in the last episode because that was the first but now we're going to talk about it's like it's like the jams and tea podcast oh my gosh oh my goodness so august what have you been reading watching listening inging was so it about? really the only thing worth reading uh worth mentioning is something i've been reading which uh for those of you who follow the jams and tea podcast this is a Manga I brought up during the paranormal segment as something that influenced that being uh, Goodnight Pun Pun. Ooh. This is uh, an Inio Asano manga who is known for like really messed up sexual stuff. Yeah, I've specifically in the coming of age. Heard some shit realm. about this over the years, and I've wanted to check it out. Yeah, it's like mm. one of the high. It's like a nine point one seven on uh, my anime list. Fuck. Very wow. highly rated. This is only the first volume. This is all that I've been reading or rereading specifically, because uh, I wanted to get into the series proper. It's very weird, angular. Uh, like the art is so distinct. I gotta find a page without nudity on it to get this across. <laughs> oh boy, uh, how fun. But yeah, the art here is very stylized and distinct. It, he's got such a weird perverted vision of coming of age and it's really fun and depressing to read. Oh, my brand. So yeah, uh, you gotta gotta give it a ch give, check it out. I, I definitely will at some point. I have an enormous backlog of mangas, but like, it's not like I'm gonna put that at the end because I haven't prioritized anything. I bought that fucking um, uh, Oshimi manga, Happiness, the vampire one, the guy who wrote Trail of Blood, oh, yeah, AKA yeah. Uh, translated to Blood on the Tracks here. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I've wanted to read that because that's a coming of age story with vampires. And I'm just like, well, that just sounds like my shit. And I just yeah. never read it for whatever reason. because I'm an idiot. Um, speaking of me being an idiot, I guess. Um, I haven't watched too much, uh, mainly because we've uh, used our spare time to consume the thing we will be talking about today. But I have been going through two anime that have just been like clawing at me for a rewatch slash a like just more dedicated watch and that is i got the blu-ray of one of my favorite series which i did mention uh, uh last podcast episode which is eureka seven i got um the blu-ray of that and i've been sort of steadily going through some episodes of that and ooh, good gosh golly is that show good um <laughs> wow i i kind of forgot how how great it was just how consistently beautifully animated and written that it is um do not under any circumstances ever watch the English dub, like just ever, because uh, my, my boy, I, I love him, but Johnny Young Bosch, do not voice characters younger than 13 years old. Please, please don't do that. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's no, really bad. Uh, it, it's funny you mention Johnny Young Bosch and like 13 year old characters, like under 13 characters, because there was like, the show that came out a while ago, uh, Yokai Watch. I liked the games as like yeah, a, that Pokemon thing. Yeah, it was kind of a Pokemon adjacent thing. Uh, 
I liked the games a fair bit when I was in middle school and as it happened the anime was brought to English around the same time and it has a very similar problem where Johnny Young Bosch does not at all work as this little kid main character and it <sighs> it's unwatchable. <laughs> It sucks too because it's like the only reason I say that is because he's he's he plays he plays Renton he's the main character and like literally every other English dub voice is perfect all of them flawless like the dude who plays Holland I am almost like tempted or I think it might be Crispin Freeman but like I'm tempted to recommend the English dub almost just so you can hear their performances but it's like if you're watching it for the first time English all the way English it's like his voice is it's so it's so annoying please stick to playing characters that are slightly older like I I love you man but ugh. um but yeah I've been going through that and it's just like it's a quasi mech show mainly coming of age story about a, a a young boy who is sort of like whisked away on this rogues gallery uh ship of like anarchists uh, who are sort of like fighting against the uh, the state that they live in, and it's about him and his relationship with everybody in the crew, and his relationship with uh, uh, the love interest, uh, as they say it, Eureka, which drives me insane. It's like it's Eureka. I'm not. I'm, I'm not fucking touching that shit. I'm calling mm. it Eureka. But um, uh, it's 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 really great shit. I think if that sounds like it'll be for you, it'll definitely be for you. It's it's just phenomenally written stuff. Great characterization, amazing soundtrack by Naoki Sato. It's like really weird occasionally. Like there's like trip hop stuff, and then there's like dance punk stuff. It's really weird, but it's uh it's awesome. And uh, I've also notably a show very much like JoJo, where Western music is used to uh, denote the naming of uh, certain character mechs and the stuff yeah it's basically like it'll show up and it's just like when you're watching jojo and then sudden it would just be like oh motorhead and you'll be like what the fuck? okay <laughs> yeah. cool no like, I, mean, I too love ace of spades yeah i mean i i obviously haven't seen it uh you definitely inspire some confidence to check it out uh for me i but. would bet money that you would at least like partially enjoy it it's like a 50-ish episode thing so it's a bit of a commitment but it's okay. also just like I would describe it as it's a studio bones thing and it's 2005 uh, okay. and it's basically what happened was it's it's an anime original thing it's not based off of anything what I think happened is that they came right off the heels of finishing 2003-2004 Full Metal Alchemist and they sort of had all these creative ideas in that second half of that show that I just don't think work at all. And then they were like, oh man, what if we made something original that had some of the ideas, but like we actually put it in a story that makes sense. And then that was basically what I think happened is that they were just like, okay, let's put it in Eureka 7. And it's like, oh wow, this works like gangbusters. Cool. So, oh, yeah. And yeah, the other show I've been watching is a bit of an older uh, classic I've been watching. Um, uh, shoujo classic, magical girl classic, uh, revolutionary girl Utna, which um, fucking bizarre show. Like just from the outset, you are thoroughly unprepared for how immediately weird it is. Every character in that show speaks like they're in like a Yorgos Lanthimos movie, and they all speak in like riddle and like metaphor occasionally. But then there's like Utna, who's just like this character who's just like I don't fucking know. It's like who 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 are you 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 fucking douchebag? And it's just like it's weird and refreshing. And there's like a funny Greek chorus in it. It's 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 insanely gay. Like just like not even subtext. It's just. It's just blatantly super gay. Which... Yeah, uh, like notably like a post Ava show, mm -hmm. except like not not being like the crappy shows people have forgotten about, but like doing its own thing with the same like DNA. Yes. It, it's got like this really gaudy pastel uh, aesthetic that's kind of like hazy and stuff and like there's a lot of reused animation in the first part of it but it's like kind of like a you know being a take on something like sailor moon i kind of expect something like that and the more it progresses like i'm only in the student council arc which is the first one and it is already weird and i've like read part of the manga so i know where it goes but like it just continually does nothing Thing, but like once you get to the apocalypse arc it's just like wow no this this is the reason why ava is talked about so often because it literally infiltrated fucking everything yeah. but yeah that's also really good hope i can finish that soon but yeah that's about it on my end all right sweet so uh subject of the day
All right, people, we are talking about We Were Correct. It is the 2011 show, Mirai Nikki, Future Diary. And uh, it is directed entirely by one Mr. Naoto Hosoda, uh, whose only credits, as far as I can tell, are this and the OVA, uh, which is, you know, not entirely promising, but well, we can discuss his contributions to this story later. Um, this is an interesting show because I wanted to talk about it because I had seen it all before. I watched it in high school. As to what prompted it, at first I just really couldn't remember. I was just like, God, what made me want to watch this? Because this is not the kind of show that I like sought out. Like I would like in high school, I was consuming shit like Fate Zero. I was consuming shit that was like this really like acclaimed stuff that I was going after because I was like, everybody's talking about this. Like I had missed the boat on this because I watched it in 20. 14, 15. So it's not like anyone I knew was talking about it. And I remember, I think the reason I did was because I'm curious to know if you know this, August, but there's like for a while there, there was a very small group of anime reviewers on YouTube. They were like a very niche thing because like movie reviews were just basically like the entire spectrum of entertainment and criticism. And then there was like a couple people, like uh, the some channel awesome people like Jesse Otaku or Bennett the Sage. Um, but one of the people, uh, went by the name of Glass Reflections, and oh, I watched him yeah, a lot. Yeah, okay, the, yeah. The the blonde dude who wears yeah. that that weird thing. I, I watched. He was like the first anime critic I got into, and it's funny because the more I watched his stuff, the more I'm just like, wow, I I hate how you look at art. No disrespect to the man, but like the mathematic way he does scores drives me insane. But I'm pretty sure what happened was he mentioned this in the same breath as he mentioned a show called Higurashi no Naku Koro Ni, uh, translated to When They Cry, and I watched that in high school and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, it doesn't really hold up, but I think it is a conceptually and structurally genius show that just doesn't really live up to its potential. But I was looking for more of that because I wanted more like horror-y things. And this wasn't really that, but I don't think I knew that at the time. So I just sort of watched it. And it, it may be, the first time in my life where I was so compelled by how thoroughly trashy something was, I simply could not stop looking at it. I was just sitting here in my room watching each and every episode of this and I was just like, how do they manage to make this real? I don't understand how someone was given the money to make this and now I'm far more anime storied. I'm far more movie and entertainment storied. And I'm like, I want to know what happens if I come back to this because I remember this being fucking nuts and you have not seen it before. So no, you I, went in yeah. totally blind. I, I and mean, I was partially... Well, well, for context, I, I guess it's fair for me to also explain yes. uh, Future Diary because uh, for kids who are not, I'd say... Kids who were like under the ages of like, I don't know, uh, like 12 in 2011, uh, we didn't have this kind of ver future diary as our kind of death game story, which every like four or five years has. We had uh, yeah. the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. my exposure to to future diary was always like, oh, it, it was the, the fad before the Hunger Games and and like before future diary you had like i don't know battle royale among yeah other it's very very much in that vein yeah good comp and i i think at first i was worried when i recommended this for the two of us to watch because i was just like what if this a isn't as crazy as i remember b maybe it's just like elf and lead and it's fucking boring and bad or c maybe this just won't create a a good avenue for discussion so color me surprised when August and I, in, in two sittings where we watched episodes one through 13 and then like, or no, one through 12 and then 13 through 25, yeah. I've, including the OVA. And the only way I can describe that viewing experience was just continuous hooting, hollering, cheering. Oh, it was it, like, just, just madness. It was the most fun I have had watching something in so long because there is so much about it that is worthy of dissection and like review and like merit and it again two things it boggles my mind that something like this was allowed to exist because even in the avenue of anime like I think another death game show that sort of like 
reared its head maybe a little bit after this that was sort of in my consciousness was um dead man wonderland which has a lot of the same um mm, yeah. vibe as this in the terms of how like edgy it is and how violent it is and i think that sort of spawned the dangan rumpa thing which i don't really know a whole lot about i just know that i've seen like playthroughs of people play that and i'm like it's basically this shit it's like weird high school melodrama meets high concept death game shit which this yeah. is like august said that it was like the hunger games the premise to future diary is that oh, we have this <laughs> this this <laughs> we we have a a structure for this but i'm going to lay the groundwork okay. premise wise because <laughs> I'm, I'm, otherwise it'll be impossible too good it's so funny <laughs> like i can't contain myself <laughs> okay um <laughs> the the premise is we <laughs> the premise is we follow our main character yuki teru um, who is Yuki Teru Amano? Typical Yuki, Yuki Teru Amano, which you will not forget the name of because his name is said eighty-seven thousand times throughout the course <laughs> yes. of these twenty-five episodes. Um, uh, reversal of what I said about the Eureka Seven dub here. Please watch the English dub of this for two reasons. One, the Japanese girl who voices um, fucking uh, what's you know name you know you know Gasai. She is intolerable. She says the word Yuki in the highest pitch possible and it buries into your skull and it's annoying. And the English cast is just pretty good. Like everybody, like August and I developed a theory about the English dub is that they sort of like, whoever wrote the script for the English dub clearly realized how bad this show is and like leaned into it and made like the dialogue and intonations and delivery like really apparent so that like, almost all of it just uniformly really works within its bizarre tone. Like I wouldn't watch it any other way, but so do that. But we have our main character, Yuki Teru Amino, who is, you know, UG every lead. Dude is every lonely high school boy character in anime. There is nothing exceptional about him whatsoever. And that's like his bit, you know, because every character who's in a show like this post Shinji Ikari has to be Shinji Ikari, yeah. except they tell us everything about his character. Like they're reading it from a Wikipedia article. Yeah, it's it's like the joke in uh, Angel Beats where they say the one guy's <laughs> defining personality trait is that he has none. <laughs> Angel Beats. God, that's a show I haven't thought about in some time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we've got this, this dude, and he is so withdrawn and lonely that he just sort of accepts the fact that he hallucinates talking to God. And I don't mean like like God in the, the like, you know, in the like Christian a, sense. Like a Judeo-Christian, I mean, Islamic, any any recognizable earthly human god yeah it's like it, it, it's like a deity but it doesn't bind itself to any like culture it's just clearly something that the artist like drew and it's just like i have never seen anything that looks like that design mostly because that design is very bad but <laughs> yeah, he just talks to him all the time and then eventually one day for no well well for a reason for a but <laughs> we'll we'll get there boy will we get there but he finds himself involved in a death game that is being conducted by God because God is for some reason dying and needs to find a successor so that their power can be inherited in a vessel. So he gets like 12 people, like Fate Zero style, and picks them and gives them all a cell phone, which dates this remarkably because mm. everyone has a Motorola Razor. Yeah. <laughs> it's everyone just gets a phone and it's called a future diary. And it's, this is the most difficult part to explain because this does not make sense. No. And I don't mean it in the way that's like, oh, it's like Kingdom Hearts and it doesn't like, no. This aspect of the show is one of the many things that simply does not adhere to logic because it's a fit, like the phones that they get predict the future. But all of them predict a future in a very specific way. In a that way that's, yeah, it's like- It's tailored, tailored to their personality. personality. And like, Jinx. there's all these gimmicks and they'll explain, it's, it's like a Jojo stand. And they'll just yeah. sort of explain what it does. But the thing is, 
is that they all just do the same thing. They like they do the same <laughs> bullshit, but like very, very slightly different. And, and there's all these like there's a lot of rules and stuff, and it's like. It's, it basically strikes a middle ground of being like it doesn't go into like death note levels of detail in regards to its rules but like that's sort of the name of the game with a show like that but basically the future diary is just like it'll send you a text message if like somebody's close to you and about to kill you and it'll warn you and it'll send you a text message that says like dead end if there's like a timeline you're in where you're about to die and the way this show treats time travel is like we could we could do an entire podcast we'll, that's we'll, we'll get to that later <laughs> Yeah, but these 12 people all get future diaries and it's just like they have to kill each other now. And um, so they can succeed and take over the, the throne, the throne of God. And that's only like 10% that, of the show. That's, that's the, that's the, like, that's the baseline idea. The, the real, the, real the premise of the matter here is. Uh, the real premise of the show is. Uh, my favorite fictional character of all time, you know, Gasai, um, uh, who, as a character, Yuki, once he gets involved and is made aware of this death game, is like freaking out because he's useless, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this girl shows up and protects him and kills the guy who's trying to kill him. And she is head over heels in love with this dude, like 100% top to bottom. And he's like, never met her before and like, can't remember her from even though she's in his class. And basically, I don't wanna, this is definitely not the first time this has ever happened in anime, but Yuno Gasai as a character is like a landmark in character she, writing she because she is like... the Yandere. Yeah, she that's... is like in how Asuka <laughs> is, the Asuka and, um. Uh, Rin, uh, Rin are uh, like the Sundere. The Sundere's. Uh, she's like the Yandere. She's the yeah. The, she's the even got the hair. Color. She's got the pink bubblegum color to it, and it's like she is like she's she's fucking crazy. Like it makes it dead apparent that this girl is a psychopath. Like and a psychopath, no less, who has confirmed killed people before the death game. So mm. keep that in mind. And as, show... as with most, as with like weirdly most, but not all of these people, where like some, where like some of them are serial killers, some of them are terrorists, and then there's like a lady who runs an orphanage, and and these people are all on the same plane in God's mind as his successor. <laughs> like it, it's like there's never any logic behind it either it's just like oh i chose these fucking people and it's like okay sure whatever but like they'll they'll come around and it's like the, the the goal here really is that it's like the premise of fate zero where it's like oh you get to pick interesting historical character x and then throw them into the mix is that these characters are just like basically the character concepts and many of the ideas in here is that i frequently referred to this as being the end of evangelion if it was written by the girl who wrote the fan fiction my immortal and i think yeah. that's the best way to relay what this show is actually like and what these characters are like and the show its real premise is that it's yuno and yuki teru running around and encountering all of these characters in the city that they live in and killing them in kind of a monster of the week way uh, at first, but also slowly developing the relationship between the two of them as they go along. And there's like a, a weird kind of thread that like, you know, something is amiss with, you know, like, even though, you know, like lots of things that uh, Yuki in context of the universe does not know, you know, that there's just like, something else under the yeah. surface here and then the second half of the show becomes a little bit more like i won't say focused but it definitely is it, more it, reliant like on what's established they, it's, it's when they want to like actually delve into what that below the surface of you know truly is it's when they when they actually take the focus from yeah monster of the week to like character driven i want to put in quotes Yes, it's it's very much like the first half is Death Game Monster of the Week and the second half is really a character study. Like, I'm not even joking. It's like, it's the, the show's execution of said character study is definitely up for debate, but that's what they were going for, for certain. It's, um, yeah. But now that we've laid the groundwork, we're going to divide this video into three sections. The three sections include the things about Future Diary that kick ass, 
the things about Future Diary that are fucking awful and the things about Future Diary that do not make any sense at all. So welcome to uh, the jam. <laughs> welcome to hell. And I'll admit, there's a lot more that was going to go into this segment than I originally gave this show credit for. Yeah. It, it pissed on a lot of it. I will say that, and we will get to that it, in the next does. segment. But there are many, many different things that make this show uh, delightful. And I, um, I think, and I actually have a point for where I think all of that is encapsulated by, hmm. I think all of, like, most of what is great about this show is put right out in front of you in episode two uh because episode two is right after the first episode where they've killed the serial killer who in a random throwaway line is revealed to be their teacher who we saw in like one shot and i even like while we were watching this speculated okay this is going to be the reveal got it right it's because it's the exact same thing they do in fate stay night where That's, it's just like oh the teacher God. you see in one scene is also one of the contestants and yeah, nobody right. cares about him <laughs> uh but then in like where we have this random scene where you know and yuki are like bantering between themselves about whatever and then the school gets bombed <laughs> It, it half of the school gets blown up hundreds of people are killed and there's this terrorist outside demanding yuki teru amino be handed over to her by the other students meanwhile she's put like a landmine of, of of explosives in the track field so they can't escape otherwise they're going to be blown up and if they don't hand over yuki she's going to blow up the other half of the school it's and she's dressed like a French maid in like like pink. Yeah, um, and, and, and also I, I love again. this character. By the way, she's great. Yeah, <laughs> one of one of the best voice performances in the show is whoever voices her because she is consistently like one of the people who clearly knows how ridiculous what she, she's she in knows is. The show that she's in. And Basically. she shows up, and it's just like you think that it's going to be this like monster of the week thing, and it is. But there's like a weird Dragon Ball Z thing where half the people they fight end up being villains that fight for their side and they have constantly shifting alliances, kind of like fate. But like this character, and <laughs> another great thing about it too, the, uh, is that you gradually learn that all of these characters tangentially know each other through means that have nothing to do with like the diary like yeah. they just all happen to sort of be like oh hey you are the like one of them is a literal toddler whose parents die and like it's <laughs> <laughs> it's and one of them's like the police chief one of them is like the mayor of the city and the ones like the the criminal the the police have been chasing after and then there's like the vigilante dude then there's the cult leader then there's the lady who runs the orphanage i i sound like i'm making this up as i'm going but this is real. It's like mad libs <laughs> that's, that's a great <laughs> way to describe it's it like the first like chunk of this show is deliriously entertaining because it's like you have that terrorist character show up and like she gets her eye gouged out at the end of the episode and then she gets like an eye patch on and like a glass eye and shit and it's just like there's a bunch of different things that keep happening and wheels that keep spinning and like there's an inch th there's a semi-interesting way they try to go about the tactics of some of these fights which we will mention in this next segment too because i think that there's a clear divide when the first half of the show has a lot of like tactical stuff that while silly is in Engaging, and then all the tactical stuff in the second half of the show is dog shit. It, it becomes <laughs> nonsense, bullshit. It, that, just, just like literally not even worth paying like, attention there, to. There's, but, like, a, there's like a scene that's bla blaring in my head right now to perfectly describe that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. So you have this like engaging, if silly, like setup and these mechanics to this plot. And basically it's sort of a roundabout of showing you these characters. It's like you have this terrorist character who's like a war orphan, she like bombs things and shit. And it's just like, she's just sort of um, gets tossed aside to the wayside until like the second half of the and first she's part. She's got this fringe romance, by the way, with one of the- With a detective. With a detective, yeah. 
who just kind of keeps showing up, who like works for the police chief, and the police chief is in the death game. Yeah, he is, um, and, he is. and he sides with the characters, which is why they're sort of like forming alliances at first. It's like the the, the police chief, Yuki, and um, you know, like those three, and he's just like, hey, I'm on your side. I want to help you because I'm a detective man. And they just sort of like keep encountering these characters, and then like the next character afterwards is a stealth cult leader yeah whose backstory is um Ew. yeah that'll be in the next segment yeah um uh but sh sh like th there's just so much shit that happens and then it's like the, the the interesting part is that the show is selectively aware of the fact that you know is constantly gaslighting yuki yeah lying to him gaslighting him uh just like generally trying to like she is basically a perfect encapsulation of like if you've ever been in high school and you ever had like one person who you were not attracted to or interested in just like follow you everywhere and be like really annoying and clingy this is a horror movie version of that person. yeah and and like and and i think you bring up a great point there that like sometimes they acknowledge it for what it is it's like this weird like this is fucking terrifying get away from me but then other times they'll play it straight as this like lovey-dovey romance thing without a hint of irony yeah and like that stuff rings as really like um like just like unsettling but then the second half of the show comes in and kind of recontextualizes a lot of that because you're you're finally aware that in the second half of the show that the main character isn't Yuki, it's in fact Yuno. Know, yeah, which is, which is a great bait and switch, I I think. Um, if it didn't get lost in the minutia of the plot so much in the second half, then maybe I would like genuinely compliment it on that. But there's just moments where Yuno you know, like does these things and it's just like. Um, like she's clearly un like unflinchingly devoted to him in a way where she like she does care about him, but also in a way where she wants to control him. And the voice performance of Yuno, I really want to compliment. It's really good. She oh, yeah, her voice great. actress is like she has to have a range, and she nails it. She can do like she's batshit insane when she needs to be, but she's also really vulnerable, and it adds like a layer to her character that like feels a little bit more real despite how cartoonishly ridiculous everything becomes yeah no so I mean, yeah all, all around the board i think the voice performances like elevate the writing in a mm -hmm. way it's that dub script it's it's genuinely something else it's, it's like the ghost stories we mentioned this when we were watching it and it was like watching ghost stories when you're just like man somebody got a hold of this translation and just went stupid hard on making it really funny yeah like it i i mean i haven't seen the original but i i can't imagine from from like the way you've described it i can't imagine it has the same level of like I, I struggle to say self-awareness. Tongue in cheek. Tongue I would in cheek. Call it. Yeah, that's a good. It's with, see, yeah, with the Japanese script, the thing that I remember very vividly about it is that it's very just kind of like the the biggest bar for entry with the medium of anime for me, not even necessarily for me, just because I got into it when I was young and my brain just sort of accustomed to it, but like with other people who got into it later in the game, is that like Japanese dialogue in shows like this is really really overly expository like a lot and it doesn't always hit the same way because like if you're a Japanese person listening to the Japanese audio you're hearing how that was meant to say if you are an English person reading the English subtitles there's still a barrier there and it doesn't always translate right yeah which it kind of makes it a little uncanny in parts but like that's why I just prefer this just because it's like it's its own take on some of this stuff and it's clearly really really funny oh one thing we have to mention that doesn't really have much to do with the show but the first opening to this show oh is yeah hype as it's hell so it it's so fucking good fucking symphonic japanese dream theater yes like, it, like, it just rips it's it's like i i don't know if it would quite qualify as like visual k type stuff 
Mm. But it's it's definitely in the same venue of like symphonic prog, visual K, like dream, your dream theater X Japan stuff. It's got that level of intensity, and it's it's we sung were in, fist pumping every oh single it, like th that that show like that opening. No matter how tired you are, which we were, we stayed up until four in the morning watching yeah. the second thing we, it, it, it keeps you going the second intro is like fine or whatever but it's just it's just not the first one it's not the first one and no but and like yeah, th yeah this that's... intro has like four languages in it it's like <laughs> japanese german english latin yeah they've got a part where they say ein zwei dry in the chorus and then they have a part where they're naming like roman gods yeah for fucking no reason as for far as no, I can tell. no reason like Maybe, and then the normal lyrics are just about the show. <laughs> I, I never like, like paid attention. Maybe they named like twelve Roman gods for something some, like that. Some and significance. Maybe they're all supposed to represent them, which I don't think the show played I, up very much. I, if that I was supposed to be the case, if, if that was supposed to be the case, that's yeah, not communicated at all. Yeah. Um. But I I, I will say, um, like a lot of the mileage of this show is definitely the ridiculousness factor. And like, once you get to, I think the show really begins to hit it. it. It suffers a brief divot halfway through where like for a couple episodes, it just kind of meanders, which our friend Morgan uh, watched some of this with us. And he was there yeah. for literally the three episode long span. Like the where worst nothing happened. part of the show. Yeah, easily the worst part of the show. And then left Sorry, and then immediately, Morgan. immediately things became insane again in like the best way possible. Yeah. But like basically, it keeps just this constant rotation of these insane characters and killing them in a way, but also slowly divulging information about Yuki and Yuno. And I will say, there are moments, rare moments, where the relationship between the two of them does ring as genuinely very sweet. Oh, and yeah. That makes it way more uncomfortable. And I, I really got to applaud it because and, <laughs> that and, second and yeah, half. Those. Those moments, and this is something the show does very well in like the subtlest way possible, where if you're not thinking about it, you're not even going to realize this is an aspect of the show's writing. Uh -huh. But the way this show is written is so that by having an inc a like continuous chain of strange absurdities, you tend to like neglect in your mind moments where a character will do something fucked up that like normally would be unforgivable like there's a point where you know like kidnaps the main character and like essentially rapes him but the uh, show yeah, does does this fun little hot potato where because it, it throws in so many weird things immediately following that your mind becomes conditioned to like forget that happened so you can just continue to buy this romance and in the strangest way it's, that is a perfect thing it's because it's like yuki and the audience are in the exact same page with you know the entire time where it's just like he still knows that she's like fucked up and has killed people but the thing is is that the show by doing that revolving door of absurdity it's just like comparatively speaking you know is like his like grounds him and that's what makes this portrayal of an abusive relationship which it unquestionably no, is by the show an it is and it's basically her being like everything in the world is terrible and crazy and awful and i am also terrible crazy and awful but i am significantly less so than the world so you should love me and that is fucked <laughs> like genuinely that's some american psycho shit yeah it's really oh God. really disturbing to witness and watch unfold um and and that's that and like us talking about it in this like good segment it's like almost a misnomer because like this show is so weird in that you can't really pin down what it's trying to convey like like there's no real intention in the writing or direction of it like yeah yeah good point like there's like if you ask me or if like i asked the creator and writers of this story i was just like so what was the message you were trying to send what, what's, here what's the tone I, I don't think that there is one yeah i don't I, think i could get an answer which is which is okay because it's just like you also have a story like elf and lead where it's like also does that and is also tasteless in a lot of similar ways but also it's because that show is vacant of ideas like you can be you can have ideas and still not have themes and future diary just suffers from an abundance of too many ideas and not enough themes 
like yeah. it'll have them on like an episode by episode basis like especially in that second half where it like really goes hard on trying to um characterize the opponents in the game like that couple that's in like the like, like the space needle yeah, and stuff in the... and oh good yeah there, there's a lot of stuff that when i talk about the sec like half of the second half we will talk about in this section and then the other half we will talk about the next one yeah. but i think i think indisputably um other than the fact that the show just sort of like goes commits to going fully off the rails with some of its plot twists which mostly uh do not work just because of how like chaotic it is you can't even fully appreciate it in that no, second and, half yeah and it's it's in that same way I, I literally like just talked about where like that revolving door of insanity leads you to like sometimes a, a moment that should be insane is kind of dulled on you because yeah, it's kind of genius like you you give these ideas to somebody who just like like give it to me I, we, we at several points while watching this we were just like imagine if we got the budget of this and like oh, our goal was to make a show like this but like catered to us and we would make the greatest disaster ever made like if you gave me future diary and you were just like keep all of the components of this story but arrange it in a way where it has a cogent point it would be like good yeah <laughs> like no, you could that there's like there's like the building blocks to make something interesting like genuinely interesting on like a philosophical level and not interesting on a like car crash level yeah like there's a thing you can talk about here with the way yuki like leans on the people in his life like that is the most consistently interesting thing that the show does is oh, that yeah. like it just sort of shows yuki in this constant flux of having to be like he his problem is that he's codependent on everything it's like it's it's really weird that I, and i hate saying it but it's like it's really good characterization on the show's part because you think he's just going to be this useless shinji ikari wannabe and the show's not going to do anything with him but the show smartly is just like yeah a kid like this is going to find pillars of strength like you know like his friends like other people in the game or just like anything and he's going to, to latch onto that and they're going to have a semi symbiotic and parasitic relationship it doesn't quite hit home because of some of the stuff that it does in the second half but that idea is definitely a pervasive thing and it's also with other characters like there's uh characters that sort of parallel their struggles a lot in the second half which oh is, yeah a lot of it's very yeah smart. that's that's Oh yeah, specifically with the Space Needle people. Which is maybe like other than the ending, the most batshit insane part of the show because oh, like God, they, they all just sort of get together and like there's this weird tenuous alliance between you know Yuki's friends and Yuki and they're all just like in this place and they're teaming up together to stop these guys and they sort of just like bounce in on them, completely wreck their shit, run away for no reason. Oh yeah, this was at and, the mansion. Okay. Yeah, the mansion, which is um, also not a particularly great part of the show, but then it balloons into them going to this like space needle building the, and the part the of this show cover <laughs> yeah we oh my god that was so fucking i'm pretty sure sersha made it was either you or sersha that made yeah, that joke was, shout out to sersha who sat through the final 12 episodes of this with us without uh, any context without any context and was completely baffled she she just could not look away she stayed until the very end yeah. um but yeah there's this part where the like the, the the most genuinely sweet part of the show is when Yuki and Yuno have like a day to spend together, like irrespective of all the drama, and it's just like cute slice of life shit. And yeah, um, that's which, in like episode four or something. Yeah, and then like later they sort of like they do this fake thing where they do like a like a wedding regis registry. Photo. Oh my god, that. Oh and, and then like the God. woman who who does the wedding registry photo is the wife of the police commissioner character yeah, in the yeah. game. And um, so they like, they have these moments and it's just like you have these sort of like this connection that's actually forming between them. And like Yuki's just sort of like, eh, she really cares about me though. And like, it's, it's really sick and really codependent and scary. But then you have these two characters who show up and they're just like, this fucking the only character i can compare them to is there's this couple in the show bakano who is basically just them they're just like these really weird emphatic cartoony portrayals of uh like 
two characters who are just like sickeningly in love. And they like show this entire backstory of this couple, which is um deeply, deeply fucked. And we'll talk about some elements of it in the next yeah. sh- uh, segment. But it has this sort of parallel where it's like they have this relationship that's like unshakable because of the bond they have. And it's sort of like paralleling what he's going through with Yuki. And then meanwhile, Yuki's dad Yuki's shows dad. up into the show after not being here this entire time. And is like, yo, I have an insane amount of debt. What if I killed my son? <laughs> to pay off my debts and 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 yuki's mom he kills yuki's kills mom. yuki's mom and and the other thing about his dad his dad's debt is like the weirdest thing because he says it's it's three million they never million. say that's yen or dollars and in yen that's like ten thousand bucks which is just which I mean, like, I, I don't like to go into plot hole uh, pedantic shit just because it's not what's interesting about this, but it's just like, he's aware of what's going on. It's just like, just help him win the game and then he'll become God. He'll, he'll erase your debt, he'll, man. He'll erase your debt. Yeah. But no. yeah, he ends up killing Yuki's mom, who he glanced, glanced over a little bit, which is another fucking bizarre element of this show oh my like god. yuki just comes back after all of the insanity of some of the first couple episodes i think and it's after the cult one yeah and it's right after the cult one because the the like toddler right. was like the parents the, the toddler his parents were part of the cult and they got killed in this whole schism and now this kid is like conveniently been adopted by or, or like at least being watched over by yuki's mom who mm-hmm. Uh, and he he's like plotting to kill Yuki and Yuno. But the other thing about Yuki's mom is a she has a dump truck ass, and she she is the she is a two D version of the 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 Pixar mom. Like she has like th- this show gets really sketchy with some of its depictions of women Ooh, and nudity, yeah. <laughs> and she's maybe the least sexualized character in the show, and she's hot as hell. And, um, uh, and the she other weird really thing about her. really wants her son to get laid like like unambiguously she's just like you know just shows up at his house and then like they hit it off and like she's just talking to it and then like every other line is just like so uh do you guys need me to like leave you alone like do you have protection like i i, I can i can wear headphones tonight like she's so it'll, accommodating it'll be something comp- it's like the least realistic depiction of any parent ever and, and, and it's great. <laughs> and a, a reason I keep coming back to this whole silly My Immortal comparison is because there are elements of this show, specifically that one, that feel super wish fulfillment-y, which oh, anime yeah, is no stranger to. But it's like, point. if you're writing a story and you have like a self-insert character like Yuki would be, it's just like, oh, this hot girl who's willing to kill for you is suddenly stapled to you. And also your mom is there, but like she totally wants you to bone. Like like some demented 13 year old who has just been watching nothing but like bleach and like nisa koi his entire uh, existence just suddenly has decided to write something yeah. and occasionally it's kind of brilliant um but so yuki's dad just comes back into the picture at some point and just fucking kills his mom kills just, his, pretty unambiguously kills his mom and the rest of the show kind of becomes about him wanting to become like that is the only point at which he has a character motivation he suddenly wants to become god so he can bring her back to life and, and that's and like a yeah. dilemma and that's like the whole and that leads to one of the worst scenes in the whole show where it becomes white noise dog shit but uh-huh. that's that's for a minute yeah then this is the the difficult part where i will explain the best part of the show that is simultaneously kind of terrible but also it is, I, I've not been able to stop thinking about this it. This is the part of the show where, this is like the only part of the show that we're going to talk about in all three segments. <laughs> <laughs> because- You are so right. Yeah. Okay, so this show, I think it, it's 25 episodes long and I'd say separating it into clusters of probably eight episodes is how you would structure it because the first eight episodes are very much setting the stage, uh, it's, getting it's you introduced to all the characters. monster of the week kind of part of the show. It, it's the first eight episodes of Ava where it's just yeah, like you okay. have to get accustomed to these people. And then you have the next eight episodes which are a little bit more comparatively low key and just kind of let you see these characters it, outside the it, context like of the story. It's like where you get to the character character building stuff mm-hmm. you actually learn 
you don't ju- you're not introduced to these people you learn about these people and like mm-hmm. their sc- interpersonal struggles what makes their lives difficult what keeps them up at night that kind of junk and it's worth mentioning that there are a, like a cluster of characters who just don't get a lot but i will say again i find it refreshing after we watch something like elf and lead where it's just like this show characterizes pretty much everyone yeah. very very strongly and it's like okay i i can live with like it's, it's not all good but it's there and i appreciate the attempt no no definitely but then there's the final eight episode stretch where we go into the and we keep bringing up ava and this, i this need people just, to... <laughs> this is it's end of ava but by way of yeah it's so the thing is is that it's only really apparent like we get the the earliest hint on forward we have is when there's a brief segment where yuki goes to yuno's house and yuno's house is shown in a really weird way where it's like on the edge of this suburb that like no other houses are around and like the water shut off, there's no electricity. And he's just like, how? Like she, he literally walks into the house and is like, bitch, you live like this? <laughs> and he like walks around and is like, it looks like the fucking cabin from the evil dead. And then he like walks into the backyard and there's just this giant cavernous pit. And at the bottom, he sees a body, yeah. one body. He sees one body, crucial point. Later, later revealed to be three. Three. In, and in, a, in this weird, like, terribly handled moment where it's like she buried two bodies but then there's one still there it doesn't make well we'll we'll get to it but um that's that loose end is just sort of there the whole time and the show is like you know it gets you whisked away and all these other things and but it's it's there in the back of your mind where you're just like what was the point of the show showing us that because if that in and of itself was a dramatic device it would be the dramatic device to prompt Yuki into running the fuck away from Yuno, which he does not do. So it no. has to serve some other purpose. And the purpose that it serves is in that little middle eight episode stretch when it's like the final arc and everybody's doing like, everybody just comes together and it's this fucking Avengers Infinity War scale conflict where this entire city is basically at odds with itself with these conflicting shifting alliances and betrayals and it like it it becomes a little bit too much but it's also never boring and it's like there's this hint that they keep coming back to where it's just like you know Gasai this character shouldn't be here and we're just like what do you what do you mean by that and and it's like there's there's also this implication like she she's not who she she is not you know gasai she is because uh and i will get to this now because as it turns out this one body uh our token gay character has has done a dna analysis of this body and discovered that this biologically is you know gasai who was in the pit yes unambiguously so there there is like yeah it matches so there's this point where you like all the characters find this out and he's just like the that's that is he's one of my favorite characters i can't what his name's uh, like aru 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 Which, all- here's the weird thing about his name mm-hmm. his name from what i've read in japanese translates to like to be like an existence verb which always baffles me because that would be like naming someone is or are or i am yeah which is god we'll get to that but um yeah. <laughs> uh so basically like in the midst of all this drama aru who his motivation is that he just kind of shows up halfway through the show and you don't really get what his deal is he just he shows up to be white hair uh side character he, and he shows up boy. to be kaoru yeah he shows up he, he is this show's unambiguous kaoru in like like again we keep saying Ava. This is the point where the Ava connections are like plagiarism levels of bad. Like Aru is a explicitly gay character with like white hair who's like really offbeat and strange and he's like a detective kind of like dude. And also he is a vessel for the will of God as God dies. Yeah, quite, quite literally. He is so the it's vessel like, for God. He, he's an angel. And it's like, he doesn't know, like, that's one of the things I find really, really interesting, but I can't say that it's great because it's not explored enough, but like, there's this like period where he has to like 
realize that he's like a puppet he's like not a real person and this which is, is you know this is done in like, terrifying this is done in like 52 seconds by the way. Yeah, it's just like he's he's treated this way. And we learn that Aru's purpose is to guide Yuki into the realization that the Yuno that he has been with this entire time is not the real Yuno Gasai because the DNA does not match. And there's also some weird ass plot shit that has to do with Yuno's family when they were alive owning the vault that the mayor wants to break into. Yeah. And, and then he like steals her DNA, but because it's not a match, he can't get into the vault. And like, whatever, man. What cool. it doesn't matter. Quite yeah, that'll rarely. be that that'll be something later. But so you you think about this and it's just like, well, this is a this is a bit of a paradox. Like I know this story has dealt in the fact that like you're like predicting the future, but there's no like explicit references to like, you know, time travel or anything. And or, then or the game more ends. specifically, not time travel, but like like being able to like s- hop over dimensions yes d- d- like there's like cross-dimensional travel and like i will give the show this is one of the, like I-, I only wish this happened in things that i like because the final stretch of this show becomes so left field like and not even a way that it, like d- like it built up to it it did it earned it but it also just went in a direction that i like implore anyone mm-hmm literally anyone who was watching that for the first time to predict it because i do not think it is humanly possible for you to do so because i I tried i my final guess was light years off Mm -hmm. your guess was also a better story but that's (laughs) That's beside the point (laughs) that's beside the point is that you learn that basically future diary is that you know gasai is the antagonist of the video game Undertale. And that the Unogasai in this world is from a different world where the death game happened the same way, sort of, and she won and got to be God. But problem being, Yuki, person she is in love with, is dead. So they they do that's like a this bummer. Romeo and Juliet thing. Also, Hunger Games very explicitly doing something almost identical to this. Where they very both, much so. I, I don't know which came first. I'm not going to pretend like mm-hmm. that idea is at all ripped off because you could easily come up with that independently. Just a parallel. It's an interesting thing, I think. Yeah. But the, the, the way that we find this out is that the game ends and then like the world literally starts like collapsing in on itself. And you know, just kind of takes Yuki and they just spend a bunch of time at her damn bitch you live like this house. And Yuki just is so broken from everything that's happened to him at this point. He just kind of rolls with the punches and eventually they like have sex and everything. And um, it's revealed that like, like he, he wants her to be alive too, even though she wants to die for him so he, he can be God. But he's just like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that to you. I, I and, want it and to of be course, with you. This is all on the on the assumption, which he believes that once once someone is dead, you can bring them back to life. But the key here is you can't do that. So it's revealed that the Unogasai from the dimension we were just talking about, the previous like dimension reality whatever Mm. created a new reality in which to play out the death game a second time so she could be with yuki so he could then win so then something uh, it it gets really confusing uh at points um it's also i would compare i would compare a lot of the exposition in this final third to the end of another notoriously um expository like thing that involves a lot of the same ideas and that is the end of the matrix reloaded where the architect is talking to neo and explaining that he is a remainder of a remainder of a remainder of an equation that went through all of these worlds and basically 
that whole premise of what happens in the matrix but like we never see where there is a character who's like the messiah who comes into a world then the world's destroyed and then the remainder comes back and comes back and comes back that's what happened is that you know is currently i think she, she's either on her second or third iteration I, of the I, game the, i think it's i think this is the second iteration because it's implied the first time was universe one and now yes this whole show has been happening in what we'll dub universe two yes um very crisis on infinite earth um and so basically he learns this and then like everybody in the show who like knows yuki who is still alive is trying to make it apparent that she is like you know that she's been playing him this entire time and manipulating him into doing this and she just kills all of them she just like, every single she, character she just buries every gay in the show <laughs> who can just, warn she, she she kills the the cute lesbian couple and then immediately like aru has the greatest death scene i have ever oh seen my in my God. life where it's he so reveals good. the plot twist to yuki and it is canon that the plot twist that was revealed yuki was literally too stupid to realize what he was telling he him. was too <laughs> stupid and it's the funniest thing and he just shows him the phone and you know just fucking cuts his head off and then it just cuts back to this like flat shot his corpse holding his corpse holding the phone so that he can read yeah. that this is the second world <laughs> and and like the next part though is where it gets like, you know, there's all this gobbledygook and that's not what makes the show special. What makes the show special is when it decides to focus on, you know, who is this character who has lived in this incredibly like empty world and like Yuki was everything to her. And basically throughout flashbacks of the show, you discover um, like in the final part, it sort of contextualizes everything. And that's why I say that like, I don't think she's as a whole well-written, but just as a fictional construct, you know Gasai is one of the most fascinating fictional characters I've ever come across. And it's not even because the writing's inconsistent. It's just like the way the show selectively sort of dishes out sympathy for her in the context of the ending makes so much sense. And in retrospect, watching it over again is just kind of like, wow, this changes a lot of the things that I actually oh, yeah. thought were really bad about this the first time around. That's really strange because throughout the show, it's just like, yeah, she killed her parents, she lives alone. And you're just like, whoa, this bitch is crazy. Then at the end of the show, we find out that her father was neglectful and never there and that her mother was an abusive monster that locked her in a cage and stuff. Quite literally, it just yes. puts her in a cage. <laughs> And then a literal cage. And, and then Yuno from Universe One kills her parents. But then she, when she goes to Universe Two, she not only kills her parents, but also the Yuno who is in this timeline, so she can take her place. Yes, and what I love about like her portrayal is that when you see all of these moments add together, and that it's just like she was abused, and then the best thing in the show that I actually like the more I thought about it the more I actually found like weirdly moving was that she is just this character who has grown up who is completely devoid of love or affection or warmth like it is abundantly clear that she lives an incredibly meager lonely existence she has no friends and it's just like it's hell and then there's this one moment after school one day and we find out the reason that she is obsessed with Yuki. And it's not just like a character thing where it's like, you know, oh, she's a yandere. She's got to love the main character. Like, no, there's a reason. And it's because she and him were staying late after class one day taking a test. And it had to do with like some critical thinking question at the end. And like, he got up and like delivered the paper. And then he like briefly, they just sort of have this exchange. And it's like a really normal exchange between people who are just like talking about homework. But when it shows it, it does this like Rashomon thing where it shows it from his perspective first in the first half. And he's just like, oh yeah, I forgot that that was how I met her. It's really strange that like, that was like, is that the only way she knows me? And then it goes back to Yuno's perspective later. And it's like, now that we know about her, it's just like, Yuki is the first person who has ever given her any kind of attention and it's from one fucking conversation and that's enough for her to just like literally literally 
destroy the world because she can't survive without him in it. Yeah. It's like, and, and like, that's where the gaslighting and shit comes from is that she's constantly trying to fool him into trusting her the most because she's just like, I am desperate to keep you around me because otherwise I'm going to snap. And every character is like, you need to stay with her to keep her stable. And it's like, it's, it, it, it could be interpreted as bad writing. I, that I very much understand, but I also just find yeah. something emotionally evocative about the idea of like society as at large, especially in like the late sort of like 2000s, early 2010s thing um, was that a lot of portrayals of things like mental illness in uh, media are not particularly charitable. And it's basically like it shows how there was sort of an attitude around people where they were just like oh well if something is wrong with someone or if they're mentally ill you need to have a normal person come to like ground them and that is basically like why codependent relationships are terrible and toxic and kind of like baked into like just the way we treat people like that and just the way everyone's like, no, 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 just keep her stable, just keep her stable. And he's just like in this, everyone is in a perfect position to be manipulating each other emotionally through this, uh, like this insane fucking collection of ideas. It's like someone had this romance in very broad terms outlined. It was like, I want to do this, where it's like this fucking Ouroboros snake eating itself of codependency and toxicity and now I have to create a show that is so fucking chaotic and unwieldy that it allows me to tell that story. And it's like, I don't know, like on some level it's genius. On other levels, it's it's the stupidest thing yeah, I've ever seen in my life. It, it's, it's so fascinating because it's also at the same time like almost perverting that dynamic and putting it on its head where the abuser in this case is also trying to, she, she's like the person who in typical fiction would be the codependent person. Yeah. But she's, she's asserting her power to make him codependent on her. <laughs> and, it's, and it's almost like brilliant. It's, well, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, two movies of the similar vein came out very in, in close proximity to one another that portray this exact relationship. Um, one being Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Threat, the other being Peter Strickland's um, The Duke of Burgundy, both of which very, The Duke of Burgundy more so, because that's a movie where the entire idea is that you have this, like this, uh, th these couple, this, these two women who are the, the stars of the, of the movie, and they are very explicitly um, like one is a dom, one is a sub, and the whole movie is about exploring their relationship and how subordinates in and of itself in a relationship is its own form of dominance because it has to be on your own terms and there's like a weird thing going on there where it's just this like nexus of potential like toxicity, which this show does understand stand for all of its bad qualities. It's like they they get it. It's like there's no character in the important parts of the show that is underwritten or one-dimensional it's just like yeah you know is a fucking psychopath she's a murderer but also it's just like it gives her an edge that's sympathetic without being like tasteful or uh, distasteful i should yeah, say yeah yeah like it doesn't be like oh you have to sympathize with a mass murderer it's like no i just understand why she is the way she is like it just yeah, makes sense and, and that i mean once again we should stress the point that because you understand that that doesn't necessarily equal out to being a no. well-written character it's no. just it's just an interesting thing to look at under a lens yeah and i feel like you can do that with a lot of things in this show and it's just like that was just sort of what leapt out to me the most as being if not good or even like it just it, it, it it's thoughtful like there's a there is still like an attempt to get there like we were talking earlier about this story not really having a theme and it's like this is the closest that it kind of gets to that but it doesn't really come out with like a stance or like a which i mean i guess is kind of the point but it also just kind of feels a little non-committal because no, all of those yeah. risks that it takes at the end are just so like once you find out everything about you know it's just kind of like 
oh well now they gotta like beat god and fight each other and yeah uh, no, the terrorist I, character has it, the like th there's like an internal scuffle oh, between god, the god so and his attendant which is what was able like which is why you know was able to do all of this in the his, first place his attendant also being from the first universe and not and like yeah she traps mm -hmm. somehow the attendant from the second universe mm -hmm. and, and when there. they go into the third universe at the end of the show uh, there, there's like the attendant from the third universe who comes and frees the attendant from the, from the second universe so they can beat the shit out of the attendant from the first universe who is loyal to Yuno Gasai for whatever reason. It's and, and the sort of the ending that the show has is like the the, the very ending just between Yuki and Yuno is like. It's basically that moment in Phantom Thread where they fucking like they touch hands and then the fucking Greenwood score just like swells and you realize that she's been poisoning him and it's like, oh, because they hug each other at the end and they're just yeah, kind of like it's like the end of Phantom Thread. Yeah, I God, that scene is and burned in my memory. It's, oh, it's such a fucking good scene. But it's like that's sort of what I think they're going for. But they don't they don't quite commit it to that level, which I really would have liked to see. But it's like framed as something that is both tragic and happy in a weird way just because it's like these two people are just victims of of circumstance for the most part but it doesn't really give um like yuki just sort of becomes a god at the end and just departs and leaves you know in the normal world so that she can live a normal life now because yeah, they have like so friends like, and all of this yeah so like the third universe has now become like what what he's done is instead of creating a new world in the second universe, he's kind of, I guess, taken the death game out of the third universe so that all like everyone mm -hmm. can live a normal life. And yeah, every yeah. single character, there's like a round table at oh, the end of the so show funny. where <laughs> it's it's like it's like a cheesy like sitcom thing. It cuts to all the characters who were involved in the death game, and then Yuki, because he has created this world where everyone in it can be happy, it's their problem miraculously being solved, even though half of them are like murderers and terrorists. Yeah, no. um, like it, it, like the one that kills me is um the cult leader because it's just like oh she's fine now and i'm just like okay but like in this universe she was still um raped like 90 times which i don't uh, know if that's particularly i don't know if that makes up for that speaking, frankly speaking speaking of which uh i think that's about as good a segue as we're gonna get yeah because it's like, i think it's... we've addressed all the like Intra fascinatingly great stuff about this show yeah which for the record is not it's not short on these things i i'd say that that consists like the, the the part of the show that is at least relatively good is like a solid 35 to 40 percent of it yeah no yeah and so yeah it's like it's interesting and it plays with a lot of great ideas and the imagery at the end is like really weird and they just blatantly copy a shot from end of eva again oh, yeah, like a do. couple of them like the the water and the hands towards the sun it's just like everybody does those fucking shots um like, but i like i like the ending in theory oh god i like the ending in theory though just because it involves yuki sort of acknowledging the pain that yuno's gone through and then he's just like i'm willing to basically depart from the world and be God and be separated from everybody. He, if it he, means he does you can the, be happy. He does the Simpsons, I must go now shit. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll get to part of uh, why that is slightly undermined right now because that was everything we had to say. So now... Bad. Catapulting, catapulting off of what I said about that is, um, again, uh, I do think that this show does have a lot of interesting takes and depictions on the nature of emotional abuse. Um, and it, it has some good things and good ideas in it. That said, it's inherently a very murky subject morality wise, and it definitely does not always play it tactfully. And, and, and the problem is that what we've, what we've discussed is what's so interesting here is a lot of the subtext we've kind of read for ourselves and like it's it's what you have to interpret from what you're watching because the surface level of this show is the worst dog shit ever oh man it's like i guess my the 
it, what epitomizes my problem with uh, the writing in even its best moments is like Yuki creates that new world for for you know so that she can live normally and part of that entails um just like her mother and father just like stop being evil and they like yeah. hug and shit and I'm just like I'm not saying you should have had you know kill her parents but like send her off to like child protective services it, like or fucking something don't like yeah it it deals with the the problem in just a very cheesy unrealistic way and it undermines the point of her just being like oh i'm gonna forgive my abuser and it's like yuki didn't even do that she didn't even do that yeah it's like it's like this moment for her and it's like oh forgive them and it's like "Mm." and and the problem with the whole forgive your abuser angle is that basically every character's backstory amounts to them being traumatized in some horrid way like as we alluded to this like priest character was quite literally like raped by her entire cult all of them every single one of them every single male member of the cult in succession and it's it's completely tasteless disgusting and it's not the only time the show does that. The the couple no. characters, it does that with the whole like, oh, I saved you from being raped, so now you love me. And it's just like, yeah. oh no, don't do that. Don't do that. And there are like just I think the best way to describe this show too is that like if you go into this, you need to expect massive amounts of edge. And the reason I bring up the edginess in this section and not the first section is because a lot of the edginess in this is entertaining as hell. It's really fucking funny. Um, that said, it also just undermines so much of what the show is going for in some instances. Like, again, the aforementioned three-year-old toddler murder character, which that whole episode is just a Home Alone sequel. It's, they it's are trying Home to murder Alone. each other. Yeah. It's weird as fuck. Um, and, and that doesn't work at all because, like, there, there's this weird need to tie this character to the events that just happened. And they've also got to, like, they, they've got to like balance portraying this like killing this three-year-old as like heroic tragic and just way too much for even like a competent writer to handle and it this does is it in 20 minutes and does it in <laughs> 20 minutes and it it <sighs> becomes just mind-boggling like what what it's like it's it's where the problem of what this show is going for goes from entertaining to just uninteresting. But at what cost? <laughs> but at what cost? It goes and from yeah. Like I I love um not that I don't love but like there's some instances of the connecting the characters to the plot where it works like the wedding photographer being the detective's wife and that leading into them having a problem with their son being ill and that's the motivation for him to become god like that is one of the first times where the dramatic beats of the show actually land is like episode 12 i think where yeah, the the detective switches sides because his kid's going to die kind of detective arc mm-hmm. and it's like that's that was really that was really good and it wasn't mostly ruined by edge which some of the other things are like the aforementioned space needle couple thing i also think um just this is almost something i mentioned in the first part but it's just like there's just first of all there's two serial killers who just happen to be serial killers not even after the thing they just are and they're just unambiguous serial killers like it, it it's like this is a town with like 50 active serial killers and one of them uses dogs to kill his victims and some of them are like robot dogs they have like a jaw on the bottom and it's like it's like that one character in is it it's is it psychopaths that also yeah yeah i think yeah it's psychopaths i believe you're talking about which which in that show it's great because it's like the world building and the characters are just like convincing you that that's a thing that could happen whereas here it's just like no there's a serial killer at large and he has a bunch of dogs and also his daughter is unwittingly becoming involved in the death game even though she doesn't have a future diary and there's this weird mexican standoff episode when they are just like in an observatory or something it's it's (laughs) the least interesting thing that could possibly happen it's because like like, maddening it's it's frustrating yeah exactly that just these characters just 
you you the show gets so up its own ass with the minutia at points it becomes unwatchable and this is exemplified for me as i was alluding to earlier by the fight scene by the like the combat scene between uh the mayor uh you know and oh, yuki and god the, and like cooking mama that uh, shit is so where whack. like cooking mama has her like 500 followers yeah and they're they're like ambushing <laughs> the mayor on the hill the mayor's power is that he knows what everyone else in the city is doing at every moment for because that's fair sure omnipotence why not and and then and then for no reason yuki and yuno start killing cooking mama's followers they switch sides because okay yeah that's <sighs> that's the worst thing in the show that, that brings me to it um oh, and God. that is um when like i i've complimented a lot of like aspects of how the show characterizes yuki however his actual character arc from before the ending of him like learning to be a badass terrible it's just awful awful, awful. You like, like it's so cringy on a dime yeah, yeah it's just like and then like he just shows up after this episode of being like completely absent from the plot and then it's just like fucking showing up with sunglasses being like get in loser we're going mass murdering yeah. and then he just like is this cool collected calm dude and then that characterization literally disappears in the final it, and and the show the show that handles this well is death note because yeah. death note l uh light yagami the, the point of his character is he's always been this person. He's just never been given the avenue to express it. Where here, it's just he changes because the script needs him to. Yeah, and it's just this all, this double crossing fucking, like they try to bring back the mechanical nature of the plot in the first half. And it's just like, oh, this person wants this and this person this and i'm just like this is the exact reason why i can't in good conscience recommend shit like fate zero to people even though that show has this problem demonstrably less because you actually need to understand a lot of the jargon they spew out whereas here it's just like not only is there a lot of jargon being spewed about how everything is working and how everybody's shifting alliances is that it's it's none of it is good it's, all it's of it is uninteresting interesting. and like you don't give a semblance of a shit about any of it no. And then there's there's like that completely boring stretch of episodes in the middle we were alluding to. Where she just kidnaps Yuki and then it gets into some weird ass fetish shit and where then, she puts a pan under his fucking butt to yeah. pee in and like starts and then beating the, him. And then the token gays have to come and save him. But God gives like one of their friends uh, a future diary for only like 20 minutes or something. Yeah. And um, that, it, like, it, also, you know, is just in a bra and underwear for yeah. no reason. Like, not a one. She just like it just cuts, and she's just sitting there on like a throne with like skulls next to her, with her parents' skulls <laughs> next to her. <laughs> it's just like, how did you think this was? How did you think this was gonna end? And again, beautifully ties into another weakness of this show, which is like I talked about how Yuki as a character is dependent on the things on his life that surround him, these pillars of like who supports him. And the only thing about that that's weak is his friends. Because like, who even are these people? Why do they matter? There's... I don't, like I haven't seen them truly bond except like one episode where Yuno gets jealous every single time um, a uh, character comes on screen, except for the most hilarious thing in the entire show where fucking Aru is introduced in that fucking observatory episode. He just shows up and fucking- He just pops his ass up out of nowhere. Cause And why he's not? just like, yeah, like he just kind of throws in like a haphazard line about the fact that he just absolutely wants to bone Yuki. Oh, it's and so good. Immediately, you know, does like the fucking kill Bill sirens, like it just turns to him and like, I'm going to I'm just you know goes on you. the fucking aggressive. She knows what's up. And, and so yeah, good. the the like Aru is the best of these characters because yeah. he's so comically written that <laughs> you can. He just came from another show. <laughs> he he just walks into this show from yeah another show from Evangelion and he he decides he's gonna be gay, 
And the other side characters, you've got like Jock Bro Man, uh, yes. Dude Bro Man, like he's- Anime version of Morgan is what I call him just because he looks like Morgan. Um, there's <laughs> hey, also uh, he's the this, two token lesbians. He's this um, forgettable vacuous character doesn't, he literally only matters for the scene where he gets the future diary for 20 minutes. Which is the most contrived thing in the whole show, which is it's, saying something. Yeah. Yeah, and the the whole like friendship aspect, it's like if you had used some of those episodes instead of doing that stupid ass plot where she takes them, what you needed to do is you need to lean into the slice of life stuff and not the dramatic stuff and show them doing stuff together and show you know like boiling the fuck over with jealousy because of it. Yeah. And they only do that like one time. Like one time. It's like, and eh. yeah. And and what it what it feels like. It, it, it feels like all of these other characters are friends, like sitting at the, the lunch table mm -hmm. and you've got these two people who are just involved in their own thing and like chip into the conversation once in a while. Like I, it, it's yeah, something just... you've seen in your life happen because you've either, you've, you've been with the group and seen those other two people or you've been one of those other two people. Oh yeah. And... Oh boy, uh, the, the Mexican standoff episode in that dome is maybe the single worst scene of like expositional logistics of a situation I've ever seen because the entire episode, the entire episode is them standing at opposite ends of this building, holding their phone up and trying to guess whether or not they flip a coin and it comes on heads oh or tails. God. And they just, this, the reasoning of them using their future diaries to predict the future, just stack one on top of the other. Like listening to it is like trying to figure out how King Crimson works. It doesn't, it's, it makes it's no sense. It's just nonsense. It's like <laughs> fucking hell. It becomes just the, these like, kaleidoscopes of uninteresting like plot mechanics that just keep stacking on top of each other it becomes like comical the point where it's like okay we got to introduce this new device so this scene can drag on for another two minutes conveniently it's the thing they need that is perfect for this tailored situation yeah which, you know, that's one of these things that in shows like this always bugs me because like, again, Death Note, a show that I'm not like in love with or anything, but that show does a great thing with its central plot device of Death Note is that it like, yeah, it has a lot of rules and it can kind of get old hearing them talk about it all the time, but it A, never once breaks those rules and B, it also continually, the protagonist is like, you know, Light's super overpowered, he's killing everybody at the beginning, but as challenges, are put in his way he is backed into a corner and has to like use the death note in unusual ways and then there's the future diaries which are just like oh this is conveniently the thing that's going like, to make the episode end the future diaries are like the worst part of this show they might as well not even be there no re they really shouldn't it just should have been a death game like, it, it I, don't, I don't get the point no the future diaries are just complete complete nonsense because there's never a point where you have a semblance of the rules of them there's never a point where like even with the hunger games which is also a very contrived not great uh thing that's that's also something where it clearly establishes the rules and power dynamics of this universe like district 12 or the or the loser people or the mm -hmm. losers who suck at everything because they come from a coal mining town uh versus like the fucking people who come from like the fishing and archery yeah. towns like it, there there's a dynamic to how everything works that you can understand and even when that that dynamic isn't explicitly developed upon you still get enough of like a general sense of of the way this universe works even if it's not amazing here it you could throw it out the window. 
August, I think you have struck the point of like, we both gave this the same rating and just based on what we've said thus far, I think people would assume that we're a bit more mixed, but everything you just said is basically why we both gave this one star is because for all of its ideas and for all of it doing like all of these things is that there is no sense of tangible details or consequences to the narrative. So as rapturously entertaining as it sometimes is and as good as the writing can occasionally be, it, it's never something where it is grounded and like you feel like tension or you feel like oh yeah involved in it that's a great point that... it, it's just external like you, you can find it entertaining but like it, it's not in a way where it's executing it like again fate zero which is this you know this is that is how you do a death game show i don't think i've encountered a better example of it and that doesn't even do it perfectly it just oh. understands simultaneously like okay exposition blah 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 blah. now let the cool characters do their thing fate, and then they do yeah fate zero like the bridge the the battle at like the bridge where everyone mm -hmm. has to come and fight uh uh enchanter is like one of the best scenes in that whole show dope because you've been given so many bits of information on how everyone's powers work what restrictions they have and you've also seen this location importantly before yes. so you so the world feels real there's a tangible sense of okay someone's going to die there is not a way this resolves peacefully and, and Future Diary stumbles in this aspect because, because there are only 12 contestants, you can't have, like, the central characters have to be involved in every fight, every interaction, and yep. you can never stray away from that. Fate only has seven, but also has the advantage of not having a central character, basically. Yep. There's so many sprawling threads which you can be engaged in, but here every fight has to center around yuki and yuno because there's there's no narrative freedom oh yeah you're i never even thought about that but you're totally fucking right about that i think that like it's it's this strange thing where they keep showing backstory to the other characters and they keep trying to develop them which they do for the most part again but like if you wanted to do that you should have just done it like Fate Zero and just have not had a main character until there were like four people left. And then yeah. it's like you're kind of forced to. But like the, the, the idea that this is a death game is so external to it is that it's just like it's only a death game in how it pertains to Yuno and Yuki. It, with everybody else, it's just like they show up and that's what makes part of uh, like that first half of that final third be just like really unengaging because all of the leftover participants of the game are just thrown it like the mayor is like the worst character in the show and i hate oh him. He he's sucks. he's like awful villain he's an awful villain he is not written at all you, you don't need an and first of all i can't believe i have to say this you do not need an antagonist in a death game show why no. that's the premise of the show or, is or that like it doesn't even even something like the Hunger Games, where there is a bit more of a defined antagonist, that antagonist is not a player in the death game. It's, it's the, a system. It's, it's the system and the government that is making this happen. That is your, like, you've got that antagonist built in, either that or you go the route of just, well, people got to kill each other. Like, that's a mm -hmm. fine antagonist, like you've made the point of. Yeah, and if it committed more to just being about Yuki and you know instead of all those other half measures, I still think it would be better, even if that's not what my ideal death game would be. It's just that it occupies this weird, uh, unhappy medium where it can't really commit to all of its ideas. And it's like, I respect the ambition here. I really do. But also, there, there's, there's something to be said when I, like, when the best parts of your show are the parts where, like, you could tell that maybe the writers or directors thought about the least where it's just like i'm here because i want to get more interactions from you know and yuki and it's like those are the ones where they're just like yeah i mean he's there like hanging out in his bedroom and it's just like they they go on the ferris <sighs> wheel and he his elbow rubs against her boob oh no uh, and it's that's that's another thing can't dance around that anymore uh, is that yeah look get... I am not a prude by any stretch of the imagination. I, I don't um, think either of us are. No. Matter. Um, that being said, when you realize that Yuno is 14, it's a little weird. I mean, like, look, 
I understand that on some level getting upset about this is kind of silly because, you know, haha cartoon drawing, and also very well aware of the fact that Japan just, like, again, not excluding it, it's just a thing about, like, entertainment and anime, it's just sort of a, a built-in component, is that these characters are not drawn to be 14-year-olds, it's just that they're drawn as, like, 18-year-olds that they can say are 14. Yeah, they're, they're drawn as basically young adults 18 24 range yeah that's how that works that said in the same way and i'll bring this up briefly in the same way where like an american sitcom can cast a 24 year old as a 15 year old yes it fucking exactly and it's like i get it on on some level i was also a horny teenager once and i was just like oh you know hot also though i just did I, I really didn't think we needed to see her topless, nor did we really need to see anybody in the show. Like the terrorist lady, just like that happens for no reason no, yeah. at all. And yeah, then the, there's the rape scene with the with a couple where that gets a little uh, bit weird, and, and it's you, like yeah, no. Uh, the the issue here is that these characters' sexuality is not well integrated into the story. It's it's just. And like, it's never portrayed as like, oh, her breasts are out just because uh, they, it, it's never portrayed as like, this isn't sexy. It's always portrayed yeah. as, oh, isn't it sexy that this lady's boobs are out, except context of the scene is either she's getting raped or she's had her top forced off of her. Yeah, and it's like, I, I love lots of things that are unapologetically, horrifically tragic. Like, I watched, um with Morgan and Tyler, I watched Paul Verhoeven's Basic Instinct a few weeks ago, and I fucking love that movie, and it's trash. I like, mean, garbage. If, if we're talking about uh, films that uh, someone... Verhoeven. That, that someone, that one of us like that happened to not have a, a great sense of taste, uh, Eating Raul. There you go. Film, there you go. Film with no taste whatsoever but it's like my favorite film of all time and i've yeah. made a video analyzing we, it we can enjoy these things and like i don't even necessarily i'm not opposed to the idea like i think it's puritanical to be like i don't want nudity in these things it goes to the whole twitter sex scene discourse thing which i am yeah, no. staunchly against but it, it's also just like you're right. It's not integrated into the character. It's it's non-diegetic nudity. It's basically there for the audience and nothing else. It's like, I think you mentioned when we watched it, you mentioned, um, it was either you or Sarah show mentioned the scene where that happens in Akira. And it's like, oh, yeah. that works because it's telling a story about how these, like, how, well, how, this how people see seedy, things. It's violent. Yeah. And how it's seen, and it's like the nudity in that is not titillating. The nudity in that is, it's, it's, it's you're gross. You want to take a shower. And it's like, that's no. how you do that. If yeah. You, want like to. you, you see this, this lady's shirt get ripped off and her breasts get groped and it's disgusting. Mm. It's uncomfortable. And they just lean into it really hard here. And it's like, again, if you perhaps aged up the characters a bit and also integrated sexuality into their characters a little bit more, which, I, I sometimes that happens, but Yuki's also just like y one Yuki of those characters, might, just like not a boob. He, he, oh. might as, he might as well just not have a penis, frankly. It, it's the fucking asterisk war protagonist yeah. all over again. It's just he, this Frankenstein's monster of anime tropes that doesn't really make sense as a character. And, and and what's what's made confusing about that is, and the in the end when he finally does, you know, have sex with uh, you know, is that like it doesn't strike you as the way this character would act or like the no. natural conclusion he would arrive to because he's never really demonstrated any sexual interest for anyone. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if he had, if he, if we like, like his interest in, you know, is prim predominantly romantic and mm -hmm. it just strikes me as such a leap in his character that We'd, we'd go from romantic to like this sexual, physical love with her. Mm -hmm. and, and like, once again, it's not a prude thing, eating Raul, uh, but it, it just, yeah, it's, it's just the broader point of, it's not for the characters, it's for the audience. Like, and look, more power to them for actually having the couple fuck, which like never, ever happens. So on one level, I respect it, but also no, yeah. just like, 
an interesting way to throw in some good characterization and just some good extra element to the show is like, what if Yuki the whole time was just like, damn, you know is fine. And that like physical attraction blinding him to some things could no, be like that, the point you could like, make. That, that could be, that's exactly something I, I was thinking of throughout the whole show that if you had included that element, the show would be so much better because it would like flow real well. And you could build, you could build up to this where here it's just like out of nowhere. Why not? Is, is it the drop of a hat? And you know, that, that all that shit with like at the end with the vault and with fucking like just all of that, there's so many shifting sides and, and what have you and so much backstory being spewed out and you're just like waiting because you know the more interesting part of the show is on the horizon. Like even if you didn't watch it, it's just like, I remember at the beginning of all this when you said that you know isn't the real you know, that is what I want to be watching right yeah. now, not no. this. And and it's it all happens at like episode 18 of 26 and you've got mm-hmm. to sit here for like three episodes of nothing happening to get the, to the three episodes where you're finally going to be paid off and have this insane conclusion. Yep. And th- there are some times when the show, this is definitely more positive for this, but like I remember the, the episode that shows the backstory of the terrorist character and the cop where it does the flashback and it's like an old Italian movie. Oh and yeah, it's, it's, and like it's, the dialogue is changed to be like oh, old yeah. timey. It's like the character is like like the god's assistant is reading it in a manga. Yes, and it's like that framing is so cool. Why didn't you do more of that? Yeah, and like that's that's a, a genuine point of creativity, but that gets just thrown to the wayside for no, it never happens stuff. again. And. I, I, I wonder what the show would have been like if it took that approach with like every character relationship and just like changed. Well, I mean, then you'd get Bacchano. But again, more things should be like that. Yeah. It, it's, it's just, I, I will also say, this is just sort of teetering on the line between this segment and the last one. It's just like 2011 show. It looks okay. It's directed okay. Some moments better than others, but like going back to a fucking 10 plus year old show is always going to be difficult but no this this isn't particularly ambitious animation wise but like what it does it does well enough no and there there are there are some moments where like you can you can get into the animation it gets to like a kinetic enough high that it's Mm -hmm. it's enjoyable but yeah for the most part the direction here is kind of unremarkable it it never struck me as like a particularly exciting aspect of the show because that's not what you're there for Let's yeah, well, honest. I mean, it's, it's w- what you need people like Tetsuro Araki for is that it's just like you have those moments and then he's good at making them feel bigger than they are, which, yeah. you know, that, that helps a show like this. Again, we talked about this. If Tetsuro Araki made this show, this would be the dopest shit I've ever seen in my yeah, life. It would this... probably be just as trashy and I wouldn't care. No, it would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I. Th- there's just so, th- this is such an Ouroboros of a fucking show that like, we come we come close to being in danger of not being able to relay what and what a joyous experience it is to just watch this communally and like every single episode even the boring ones has these moments of just th- this weird offbeat insanity where you you can only wonder like what absolute like not even how did this get funded it's just like how does a person on this earth exist and write this I don't understand. Where, where does this, where, where, what, what environment was this man raised in to reach this story as, <laughs> it's, as the it's logical outsider thing. art? Like it's someone who's never read a manga <laughs> or seen TV, and it's just like, okay, here you go. And Fucking. it's like, like write a story. He's like, what the fuck is a story? F- film twit that film Twitter tweet of it just being like a uh, guy who has only seen the Boss Baby sees Citizen Kane. It's giving me a lot of boss baby vibes. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, I- I'm sure we'll get into anything we missed in this next segment because, um, um, yeah. Let's get like, there. broadly, I think a lot of the things that are bad are just like, it weighs the show down in a way that, like, it's mostly bad through being unremarkable. Like, there's not a lot of parts of this show that isolated 
are bad. It's just the fact that they're surrounded by parts that don't really do anything to each other. It's it's like it's like you've taken apart a Rube Goldberg machine is a way to describe it. Like you've got all these individual components that don't make sense. You can see this final sketch of what this is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But like you've just got the individual components and you can't do anything like, with that. It, yeah, it's like you drop like a ball in it and it's just like everything can be like immaculately arranged and calculated. But if one pipe is out of place, then the ball still falls on the ground. Like, eh. And, and the problem is every pipe is out of place. Yeah, yeah. So um, you fix you fix one pipe just falls to the ground immediately after. Fucking, th this show is a is a hydra. You cut off one head, two grow in its place. Two. And I guess that seamlessly leads into... <laughs> we have explained why the Future Diaries themselves just are nonsense. They don't have a, a definitive usage that... And, and like, look, accuse me of maybe not paying attention to these as close as I should. The problem with it is, is that in a show like this, you need to show these things visually. Like I should be able to register. Instead, all these characters just have the same goddamn cell phone. And I don't like it. it these are never the interesting things. It's just like, yeah, they're going to predict the future with it in one way or another, which okay, it yeah, doesn't, it doesn't work. I don't, and the movie, or movie, the show just keeps making up rules. Like it gave that, uh, that future diary to that kid in that one situation. And it's just like, yeah. none of the stakes in the show mean anything now because the God can just be like, oh, hey, you get a future diary. Uh, and you yeah, get a future let's, diary. Let, let's, let's talk about God briefly. So, oh, so this, this film, uh, film fuck show, let's assume it has a scientific perspective of the universe where the universe is 3.8 billion years old. So God, so, so God apparently, uh, this God character, Deus Ex Machina, as it's called, stupidest name ever. Yep. Hack writing 101. God in the machine. Uh, so this Deus Ex Machina character, all powerful, all omnipotent, uh, doesn't, so he, he knows he's going to die at some point. Uh, Which already doesn't make sense. Doesn't you can't be sense. not if you're omnipotent, you literally cannot die. That uh, is how and, and he says that. He says, I am all omnipotent and all-knowing. And then I'm just like, why did you not think if you were omnipotent that you should have started this game sooner and, than the and, week before yeah. you were going to die? And, and so yeah, he's known he's gonna die. And and it just so happens that there's this one backwater planet in some random part of the universe with a species of primates that are intelligent enough to still have conflict to like be developed enough to have ways to communicate and have like a, a grander sense and ambition of what the universe is. But also the species of primate is not an advanced enough society where they're like self-sustaining and have built like a, a Dyson sphere around their sun and can just basically live without conflict. It just so happens that on this one planet in the exact year he's gonna, in the exact year, which is a very, 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 very microscopic point in all of history compared to this, how long this God has existed. It just so happens that there's this, this one planet which with this uh, group of primates that can do all of this stuff I've mentioned that can, that can reasonably succeed him and that he's happy with succeeding him. And this planet just out there, I mean, imagine if that, if Earth just hadn't been there, like what would he do? Would the universe just end? Would he delegate the universe to his assistant? Eh, fucking, I know this might sound nitpicky, but the thing is, the, the reason this bothers us is because it's things that the show actually says. This isn't us bringing something to this or just being nitpicky for the sake of it. They say things like, oh, no, I'm omnipotent. They, and it's just like, well, no, you're not. It's not they, how it works. They, they give you allusions to this concept, which, and you know, uh, here's the thing. I, I like thinking about the things I watch. I like think I like interpreting what they mean. And yes. when you give me a piece of information that is not developed upon or explored in a way that should it should logically be explored, you force me to ask these questions. 
And you also forced me to ask questions about the dimensional, the dimension hopping stuff. And oh God, where do I even fuck? Actually, I know where to begin with the dimension hopping uh, thing. It's like the dramatic device where it tells that you know is uh, the fake you know is like you you hear them say that and you're just like yeah okay that makes sense, um, except that it doesn't. Because she'd just have the same DNA? She'd have the same DNA, exactly. And Why? Like, like, you wouldn't be able to tell, like, it's not like it goes enough to think, it's just like, oh, maybe her fucking fingerprints are different, or oh, maybe her, it's like, no, this, no this that's is, not how it works. This is, bi- <laughs> this is biologically, physically, in every scientific sense, the exact same person with the same consciousness, same same life like there is no distinguishable difference between these people on any level and yet there's this whole plot line about the the fake dna or whatever the hell yeah it's just like oh i i fucking aru got that like i have this voice and i'm going to be fucking goro akechi from persona 5 blah 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 blah. and he just hands this hair and just like it's not the real you know and i'm just like okay first of all this like i get that aru is suspicious right but that leap he just takes where he's just like oh maybe i should run a dna test on her it's like why would you ever think to do like he's like oh well i found uh the bodies of 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 everybody in in the yard and it's just like so your first guess was to try and see if the dna matched (laughs) how about going hey Yuki, there's another you know in this hole. That's kind of fucked. Or, or like, and yeah, you, and he just kind of pops up out of nowhere during the middle of an action scene to tell Yuki this important information which shapes the literal rest of the show. And he just kind of mentions it offhand. And it's like, well, no shit, Yuki doesn't believe you because this comes out of nowhere. You're not like, be, you're not bringing a rational narrative to how this works. I'd also like to draw attention to Aru for a moment because, yeah. like, conceptually, sure, fine, whatever. But it, like, it's been it's been done in other shows. So if I'm to yeah. complain about it here, I've got to complain about it in those other shows. Fine, yeah. I can accept this. But the execution. See, Aru throughout most of the show is like an intri- intriguing, likable presence who does not get in the way of anything terrible, terribly important. And then he shows up at the end. And it's sort of, he has that moment where like God tells him because he gave him amnesia because of fucking course he gave him amnesia because why the fuck not? But he's need just- more hack writing. Yes. Uh, first of all, the moment I'm going to talk about, I just need to relate to the audience. Um, in- the moment where Aru is being told all of this stuff about himself um, and Deus Ex Machina is in front of him and he's like talking about how he's been this vessel this whole time and he's just like, okay, I don't wanna die though. Please don't let me disintegrate into nothing. And then um, Deus Ex Machina is like, okay, well, what was a, did you feel an emotion that I did not design in you? Because that's the only way you can live is that if you felt an emotion that I didn't design in you. And then August, without missing a fucking beat, just goes, homosexuality. Yeah. And then beat my love for Yuki Teru. And it was just like, I, I, (laughs) woo! It was the funniest thing. It, it, it is the funniest thing that happened to me ever since we watched Paranoia Agent. Um, uh, me, I think Tyler and Morgan, and it was that episode where all of those people are talking about Shonen Bat and telling these different stories that are mostly not true. And I was just like, wouldn't it be funny if there was a bat in this lady's sonogram? And then it actually happened. Oh my god! <laughs> and it's and it, like. I, I think I lost my mind there for a moment because it's just like, he, he that's what he keeps him here. He, that's what keeps him alive for a moment. And then he actually does. They have an on-screen gay kiss and it's just they like, do. wow, okay. I am, I applaud the, the balls. Also, yeah. I'm just kind yeah. of like, I, I get that the good writing comes from uh, the, the coalescence of uh, you know, and Yuki, but also I just want a version of this story where Aru, Aru like saves him and then they become a couple because no, I'm like, that's that way cooler. Too. I'm sure that probably exists yeah. somewhere online. So yeah, I, I'm but, sure. So 
Let's. I'm gonna get back to the uh, please the kind of uh, universe hopping stuff. Oh, yeah. and, and I sent you this earlier, so I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna kind of kind of read this this verbatim just yes, as yes, to yes, not. Yes. So, uh, second, so so for this to make sense, I'll refer to the characters as like so and so one or so and so two, indicating what universe they originally come from. So. You know one's future diary refers to Yuki as Yuki, and you know two's future diary refers to him as Amino, and this is a critical plot point. Uh, and and yet you you know one's future diary when she changes universes re suddenly refers to Yuki two as Yuki, even though he if we are to go by the show's earlier interpretation that these characters have like some, some distinction between universes, this is not the person her future diary is referring to. This is an uh -huh. entirely separate entity. This is an, an entirely separate person. Her future diary should not work in this universe because it is not bound to that Yuki. If we are to go off the show's earlier logic that her DNA is somehow different from the, the you know DNA in the pit, like we have to, like this is all in the show's logic, we're buying this. And, and now that universe, universe one has physically ceased to exist. She's annihilated it so that the second universe can now exist. Also annihilating every, bit of matter every every quark every photon every uh -huh. atom that was yuki one and yet as it's shown in the show when you die your future diary like disintegrates or like there's some dumb way it disappears but yet only you know two's future diary stays around after her death and i guess we're meant to assume that the new you know is now the you know that future diary is associated to even though that contradicts <laughs> the yuki and amino stuff we've just been shown is this a huge stupid waste of time that i'm going this deep into this absolutely it, but it's nonsense i oh my god it, it, it's just one of those things that, like the more you think about it the more it's like i don't really under it, i guess the problem with both of us being kind of like having a segment like this in the first place is that it's like look i only treat these things like i like to think about things as well and i only treat pieces of art like this um at, at the how far they're willing to meet me so it's like if you don't try to explain or do anything with these things um, that's fine. I don't care. But the second you try to half-ass them and then try to get me to pay attention to them, then we've stepped over the line no, because you want me to pay attention to them and they don't work. That's that's exactly my stance here, and that's what this show does. It half-asses it instead of committing to the bit where if you just had not brought it up, and this this is exactly why so much fantasy stuff aggravates me and doesn't work for me because it'll mm. like half-ass the mysticism and magic behind things Ugh. and not go the full way with it and it's the Yoshihiro same... Togashi you're my hero <laughs> yeah uh but it's it's the exact same thing here just that not uh -huh. committing to it properly to make it like like you either commit to it fully or you don't and this show yeah, yeah like you said, there's no middle it, ground it, it, it tries to occupy this middle ground. And the second you've crossed that line of not occupying things, of not explaining it at all, you are all, you are essentially just right in the thick of, all right, you're, ex you're gonna explain this to me or you're gonna leave me questioning it and confused. Yeah, and there's like, with the show as dense with ideas as this, I, you can't convince me there isn't a way that they could like do exactly what they're doing just with an easier explanation. Just don't like, even if you don't want to make a complete, like I don't expect every magic system or internal components to be Nen from Hunter Hunter. Oh yeah. What exactly. I do want, however, is that if you're not going to go that far, make it easy to understand. 
that's all I want. Like, just give yourself some rules. It doesn't have to be an encyclopedia. Just give me some rules and have those characters have to operate within those rules. If they have a magic power, give me a, an amount of time they can use it. Give me an amount in which they can channel it, whatever the fuck. Or this dimension hopping shit. If you want to do this kind of thing, if you're going to focus on the semantics, I don't, there's there's just no point in it unless you want to be Shane Carruth and you're making primer. Yeah. Like, I, I don't get it. Or alternatively, do, and this is going to be a completely silly example, but it's actually, I think, a good one. Do the go the route of ratatouille and just pass it off as a joke and that it doesn't matter. Totally, it's just like, I mean, yeah, ratatouille is just like, yeah, he controls his hair. Who cares? Just watch the movie. Who, it that, doesn't, uh, that's not like there's no focus put on it. He just can't, like, yeah. you see Remy like shrug okay. once, and that's all we need to, to for us to be convinced, like, yeah, this is, yeah, it's dumb. Who cares? Yeah, and, and the show, like, it comes dangerously close to not having these problems, but because of those weird, like, there's like two, two episode long stretches of the show that just become really, really tedious. And that's all you can think about when in these moments. It's like, that's just kind of all you're given to chew on. And it's just like, come on, man, you were doing such a good job at pacing all of this and making this such an insane fucking roller coaster ride. But yeah, it's so close. It's so close to being this perfect, gloriously trashy, but also interesting thing. And it just, it gets caught up in rules? Why? <laughs> Which it, it shouldn't get caught up with in the first place. And like, that's also what's so aggravating about the future diaries themselves, that it it tries to mm -hmm. go there, but it doesn't commit to it. Nope. Yeah, and that's you know the more I the more I talk about you know and my fascination with her as a character. August, have you seen Madoka Magica? I have not. Okay, we need to talk about that one day because we, there, we do. Basically, I... there's there's a, there's a character, and it's also twelve episodes or something. Yeah, it's short. It's it's got a character in it where I'm just like, now that I think about it, I think a character from Madoka Magica is just you know, but like consistently written. And I wanna see if that thought holds up because it's like, there's there's one character where I'm like, I think this might count. I think this might be it. So maybe Gen Urobuchi so, can so, pull so through. We're, we're By the way, Gen Urobuchi's version of this can be, would be the best thing I've ever seen. Well, it, I want it's, that it's, <laughs> unambiguously. It's, it's psychopaths. Fair. <laughs> uh, I mean, we, we've enough. made a couple, I mean, not, directly obviously we've just made a couple no. connections to it so i thought it was a, a mm -hmm. funny thing to no, totally worth it but yeah um i guess is like a coda all i will oh, say is that boy. you know we're about to give this a a harsh rating uh on our scales especially considering how many things about it were how good of a time we had with it and how like much we had to say in its favor but the thing is is that i just feel like future diary is a testament to how how to do and not to do something even if it's not necessarily good like there's a point where you can just sort of throw caution to the wind and just make something entertaining and it can transcend that but just because something does this doesn't mean that it inherently succeeds i would recommend watching this show to like literally everybody just because i have a oh, hard yeah. time believing you wouldn't walk away with it with a like a it, like not even a positive or negative opinion it's just a fascinating work that i just am never going to be done untangling ever no yeah this this is merely our our meditation on it for the time being yeah for real i hate um, that i've thought about this more than like actual heady anime that like deserve to be like i i thought about this more than i thought about like techno lies <laughs> I, mean, I feel i feel dirty uh, like I, how I'm dare sorry. i do this I'm sorry I know I'm not responsible. But, you know, it was like, a good way. Yeah, yeah, I'm responsible. This is, this is entirely my doing. Uh, uh, but, yeah, uh, this is a firm 2 out of 10 yes, for me, but uh, with, like, a heart next to it. I'm, I'm going to have to agree. This is, well, here's what I'll say. This is, like, to me, an ace in a deck of cards, where it is both the lowest rating <laughs> and the highest rating. You, yes, exactly. This is, like... 
a lot of people sort of lump in these like trash animes together and i feel like it's unfair to a lot of them again it's that fucking elfin lead keeps coming back and they're just like oh it's so enjoyable and i'm just like no it's fucking no, not it's boring elfin lead is boring <laughs> bullshit that's that's the thing it's like quality notwithstanding I sat here and watched all 25 episodes of that show and had a great time, despite the oh, fact yeah. that occasionally it had its low points. But like, you know, great shows have their low points too. Who gives a shit? Yeah. But like, I'm not bored and I'm also not like convinced that like, I'm, I'm certainly less likely to get put on an FBI watch list by watching Future Diary than I am at Elf yeah. Lead. But uh, the possibility has not been entirely removed. So, no. you know, yike. Uh, but yeah, that is... I was talking about Future Diary. Oh boy. Um, not sure entirely what we have, what we like, we just sort of decide where the wind takes us in terms of these things. But I know that we have already watched the first Evangelion rebuild film. We're going to watch uh, the second one after this um, and uh, the third one in the near future. I think that our yeah. next video will pertain to that in some form or fashion because I, like technically four is out, I think. Four is out, just is not it? in like, I think it's out just not in like a good capacity to the North American English speaking I'll... audience. Yeah, if we can, basically, even if we just do the, the first three and then four is its own thing, that would yeah. also work. Um, we might do that next. Um, the other thing, um, oh, um, I did see someone recently log um, uh, the third Heaven's Feel movie on Letterboxd, okay. and I'm wondering if maybe that Japanese thing finally leaked, so we can do, basically, I think the next two videos will, will be us doing trilogies. Which we'll, we'll be talking great. about trilogies, essentially, of, yeah, anime movies, yeah. and, yeah, so. So, Stick around, and if you have any good ideas for us, because Lord knows I'm sure there's things we haven't thought of, go ahead, put in the comments below what you want to see us talk about, and uh, you know, the more more power to you. The few people who've watched this and told us that we should talk about JoJo, I don't see that happen in the near future, but I respect you. <laughs> yeah, I really do. You, if we're gonna talk about JoJo, we're gonna talk about that OVA. You got look, look, you you have you are in our hearts and minds, but. Our hearts and Just, minds are also not in that. 